So in the last video, we looked at how we use creatine phosphate as a source of ATP, but that's going to run out quick. So we have to bring in more glucose to break down. We're going to get that glucose from the blood where it'll enter the muscle cell to be broken down. Or we also have glycogen storage that we can use to break down to get glucose. So we got the glucose from the body in those two forms. And now we want to break it down. And we're going to break down into these different steps right over here, starting with the glycolysis. And sometimes it goes with glycolysis. You form these pyruvate molecules, like a certain uh, breakdown product of, of glu glucose. And from that, you're going to get a little bit of energy right there. In the absence of oxygen, you can use, you know, that will be your source of energy, right? Because for this second process over here, the rest of this one that forms a lot of ATP, you're going to need oxygen, right? So these will be the two forms we're going to talk about, right? Aerobic and anaerobic. These two forms of glucose breakdown and, you know, when we might do it. So the reason, you know, these will be important later when we talk about those fiber types, right? Because the whole thing is that the key difference here is how much oxygen you have and how much oxygen you have is going to be reflected in your blood supply and, and other stuff right there, right? So there's a very kind of big difference between these two and how fast the process is as well. So first one is in times of zero or low concentrations of oxygen, for whatever reason, um, you can break down, you know, maybe this is coming from the blood, maybe it's coming from the glycogen, you're going to get that glucose in your muscle cell right there. It's going to go through a series of processes uh, called glycolysis over here. That's going to yield two little ATPs there. That's it for every molecule of glucose, right? You break it down and then the, you get two ATPs out of it. Not so many, but it's a very fast process. Very fast process, right? Much faster than aerobic respiration, as we'll see. So you get immediately, you know, your creatine phosphate is run out. Now you could start breaking down glucose in this over here. So it's faster though, and but it only does this ATP compared to that, right? And the other thing it's going to do from peruvic acid, which is the immediate breakdown product of glucose, uh, you know, it's going to form this lactic acid or lactate, right, which is going to go into the blood, right? So if you ever heard of lactic acid buildup, right, it's from when you are very tired, you've you started to go through anaerobic glycolysis for whatever reason, or you're doing that kind of exercise, you start to build up lactic acid in the muscles and in the blood. That raises a little bit of your blood, or unless it's lactate. So over here, lactic acid, right? Glucose, you're getting that energy from it. Uh, but from that breakdown product, you're getting this lactic acid or lactate. This is just the difference between the basid and the acid but they use these often interchangeably, you don't worry about it, right? So from your muscle, right, this product over here, you don't want to build up so inside your muscle because it's going to, you know, affect the acidity levels. That's going to make problems. Remember everything you learned about homeostasis. You need to maintain physiological parameters. The level of pH is very important for protein function. So myosin head ATPase activity has to be done in a certain pH level. And if it gets too high or too low, then it doesn't function properly and the muscles don't work properly. Homeostasis. Uh, you want to release from the muscle into the surrounding capillaries over here, it gets into your blood system and it finds its way to the liver eventually. And then you could take those lactate molecules and those are going to continue on to that next uh, phase over here or they can also be converted back into glucose. So that's what's happening with this little process in the absence or in low oxygen levels. Breaking it down, getting a little bit of energy, and then you're going to take the breakdown product. It's gonna go through the liver, and you're gonna either reform glucose or you can continue it into the next cycle in the liver if needed.
Okay, so that's lactic acid. So people talk a lot about lactic acid, like soreness during there. That's not too clear. That may be a part of why you get sore during exercise. Uh, although now they think it's more of like a calcium, some kind of calcium effect, like muscle fatigue thing and soreness right away. And that's different from delayed onset muscle soreness, which is about, you know, actual slight damage to the actual muscle fibers in a good way. Right? But that's your lactic acid product of the breakdown, anaerobic glycolysis. Okay, so that's that. That's when you don't have enough oxygen. What we would like to do when possible in, in longer term situation is use this aerobic respiration. And, and you know, again, anaerobic, aerobic, we're talking about skeletal muscle. Your heart is all gonna, all gonna be this aerobic muscle as far as skeletal muscle, I mean, cardiac muscle. So for this one, uh, we're gonna take that pyruvic acid that was formed from that first step. So we're gonna get that two ATPs when we start to break down glucose. Um, but then instead of going, making that pyruvic acid going into lactate, uh, this is gonna go into these Krebs cycles and so and so, right? In the mitochondria, that's going to yield this much bigger yield of ATP, right? It's a longer process, right? but you're going to yield like, you know, what was it? Two last time. This is like 15 times more, right? And this is where you're going to get the bulk of your ATP to do what? To form that, you know, to energize your myosin head, right? To maintain your resting membrane potential, to pump in calcium. Without it, you start to lose all those functions right there. So what I'm going to go into here is these uh, these right here, right? These kind of mechanisms right here, not too much, right? But why, you know, we're really talking about oxygen here, right? Why oxygen is so important to this. And then a couple of things related to that oxygen. And I say of oxygen is gonna be a necessary part of this in here, right? So what's the role of oxygen, right? That whole Krebs cycle, that continuous breaking down of the bonds, right? Starting from that, uh, starting from your pyruvic acid, right? It's gonna break down the bonds in pyruvic acid. And we don't have to know the details of this. You might've learned it in biology, uh, but basically what you're doing is creating a little energy out of each step as you break down the bonds, right? And it's mostly, there's gonna be some ATP formed but here we want to concentrate on this whole uh, ability to get this NADH molecules, right? And then what that energy H molecules from this breakdown of glucose is going to do is help pump hydrogen into one part of the mitochondria. Right? It's going to go into this so-called inner membrane of the mitochondria. And so what you've done here is build up this really, really high concentration gradient of hydrogen between these two separated uh, regions of your mitochondria. And remember what we did with sodium, right? We put a lot of sodium charge molecules on one side, and then it was ready to kind of do work. It was ready to depolarize the membrane. We we're going to use that concentration. In this case, all that stuff is going to be used in the so-called these proton pumps, pumping it hydrogen against its concentration gradient, storing it like a water in a dam, and then releasing that water in a dam through this channel over here, which happens to be an ATP, a synthase pump, which is going to add a phosphate group to ATP. So we're generating ATP at this point. All right, so that was so far what the Krebs cycle did for our, let's, you know, the Krebs cycle is building up your hydrogen concentration in the mitochondria and the hydrogen concentration is going to be used right it's going to flow down its concentration gradient and that energy is going to be captured in the creation of adp so what are we missing here where's the role of oxygen right, that is going to be a little more detail into these proton pumps right here because without the oxygen this whole thing isn't going to work this is the whole reason why 
you will die very quick without oxygen. It's because right this little thing right here. And again, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you the details, but there's this whole electron, this oxidative phosphorylation, this whole chain of events uh, where there's this whole passing and passing on of electrons over here to pump this, make this hydrogen uh, gradient over here. There's going to be all this electron transport chain, right? In a way you don't have to know. But the final elect electron, there's a whole bunch of acceptance of electrons as you move from molecule to molecule. The final molecule and all that is oxygen that's going to accept an electron. And if you don't have that oxygen there, uh, then these have nowhere to go. You don't create this gradient. No ATP is made. So that's what you want to know about oxygen. It's the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. And if you're really interested in it, you can learn all that stuff, but that's what you got to know. It's needed uh, for this whole chain of events to pump hydrogen in here. That's where the energy was utilized from glucose, but then this oxygen floating around here that you breathe in and is transported in your blood gets around here, right inside the mitochondria. That's where the oxygen is needed. And so that's going to uh, have this reaction here with the oxygen, uh, which is going to form you know, water and carbon dioxide, actually, ultimately. right? Well, this is where the water is formed from oxygen. Carbon dioxide is coming from earlier steps of glucose breakdown. That's the role of oxygen. You don't have oxygen. You don't get this gradient. You don't get ATP, right? Because you need this step right here for whatever reason. All right, so oxygen, obviously then, you need a lot of oxygen. And I just said we were getting it same way we got glucose. We were getting it diffusing from the capillaries over here. And it was diffusing through. It's a, you know, it's gonna go down as concentration gradient. Your, ox your cells need oxygen. So it's gonna be lower, higher out in the interstitial fluid diffuse in there. Very easy, right? So that's one way. And then the second way is this molecule called myoglobin, which is going to store oxygen within individual cells right here. So, you know, the oxygen diffusing from the blood is simple. It's the same story I just told you with the glucose, except it doesn't need a glucose transport. It just gets into the cell, right? Very easy. Just like carbon dioxide will flow out of it. But you also have a molecule within the muscle fiber. Deep inside the muscle fiber and all around it, you have this other molecule which binds oxygen and stores it and will readily give it up as needed. So if there's excess oxygen, this myoglobin molecule will grab onto it and store it. As the concentration changes and you know, there's low oxygen, it'll let it go. And so oxygen can be used in the mitochondria. So you'll learn about this when you get into your blood system, right? Because your red blood cells are nothing but bags of hemoglobin. And you've probably heard of this. This is what, you know, because it has iron in it. There's this iron thing that you bind four oxygen molecules for each hemoglobin. You've got millions of hemoglobin molecules in your cell. All right, so basically, this is an oxygen carrier. And that's what your red blood cells do, but your, and that's where you'll, it'll diffuse out of these red blood cells into the muscle cell, but also your muscle has this myoglobin in it, which is an additional source of oxygen. Right? And they're all based on concentration gradients, right? They bind to it kind of tightly, but it'll bind on and off based on concentration gradients. And you'll learn more details about hemoglobin, right? Binding efficiencies and all that stuff. But right now, you just want to know that myoglobin binds oxygen and releases it based on concentration, you know, whether on based on oxygen levels. All right. So that's what myoglobin is doing. And that's a specialized myo means muscle. So that's very highly specialized to muscle cells. And that'll include your cardiac muscles as well. 
So just to kind of think about that for a second, right? Your muscle cells are pretty big, right? Here's a capillary that is, you know, sitting outside in your endomesium. Here's the cell membrane, the sarcolemma, all around here, right? So oxygen to this would be the interstitial space and it would go in, right? Over here, right? all the blood vessels that are surrounding here. But mitochondria are the ones that, you know, your cell are packed also, besides your myofibrils, they're also packed uh, some of them are very packed with these mitochondria, right, which are going to be your powerhouse. They're the ones that are making the ATP. They're the ones that need that oxygen. Okay. The other process, you know, this is for that aerobic one. So oxygen is going to go into the cell, and then this is where you need it, right, into here. But this cell and one over here, mitochondria, are at a much farther distance. And this is just a really basic kind of physical principle here, right? That oxygen gets over here much quicker than it does over here. So it'd be nice if you had like a little storage of oxygen more deeper down in the middle of the cell right here, right? So that's another reason for myoglobin right here to kind of get it equally, right? There might be an unequal distribution otherwise of that. Right, so oxygen is going to diffuse through there into the interstitial fluid of the endomesium and through the plasma membrane. But then those mitochondria deep inside the cell uh, might be using the oxygen that is stored in those myoglobin a little more. All right, so here's just from your you know, histology stuff. You got to do this a cross section. It's basically this right over here, right? Here's the capillary. Here's the endomesium. Here's the individual muscle cell. Like here's one of the nuclei. Here's the nuclei showing right here. So that's what you're kind of looking at right here, cross section of that, except you don't see the little myofibrils. The way you can see in this is, you know, here's the nuclei. And you can't see any of the mitochondria, right? But they would be like here, however big they are. There's a lot of them in there. And then the cell nucleus would be over here. Here's the plasma membrane. And you can see, like all around here, these little things are blood vessels. And then, you know, each blood vessel, just to give you a size, uh, a difference in the size of your muscle cell versus a blood cell, this is a capillary, which is usually about the size of a single uh, red blood cell. So these mitochondria. Are probably too big. Never mind. All right, but you know the the red blood cell isn't too much bigger than these capillaries, right? So you know this is the difference between the size of a a red blood cell and a you know the cross section of a muscle. Also, you know they could be really long, right? So to you know the oxygen will come out of that red blood cell, but it's got to diffuse like all the way to the middle. So, you know, again, you're looking at here, here's the sarcolemma. The oxygen was all around here. It diffused in, but it's got to get to the center of the cell as well, right? So that might be a nice way to have all the myoglobin. And relatedly, you know, while we're here, it's also why those T tubules go deep inside the cell, right? The invaginations of the membrane go deep inside the cell. So these T tubules, as well as the myoglobin are two kind of uh, things that reflect, you know, the width and the thickness of the cell right there and the, th the need to get equality, you know, from the peripheral ones to the middle one. So, you know, just, this is from a whatever, right? Uh, when you see red meat like that, one of the main reasons that it is red, right, is the myoglobin, right? Because myoglobin, just like your hemoglobin, Right, you're, when you bleed red, it's because of the uh, it's because of the hemoglobin in your blood. Your muscle is red because of the amount of myoglobin. And the more myoglobin you have, the more red the meat is. Right. So dark meat, as we'll see, 
uh, has a lot of myoglobin in it, as well as a lot of vascularizations, because both of those types are very aerobic cells versus anaerobic. All right, so that's myoglobin. And I'm, I'm going in a little more detail because this carries over when you get to 145 and you think about hemoglobin and stuff. All right, so that is aerobic respiration. Anything else? No. Production of ATP for muscle contraction. Production, right? You have creatine phosphate, that storage one, right? That will form ATP. It'll build up creatine phosphate when relax, and then use that phosphate bond when you start using up the ATP. When you've used up all this, you start to go into one of these, depending on your level of oxygen. Also, if you're a certain yeast cell, you go through this and you make alcohol through this uh, product right here, fermentation. But this is human physiology. All right, so this, these are the two methods right over here. Uh, absence of oxygen, low yield, fast. And the presence of oxygen, high yield, but takes a little longer, right? So those are your production of ATP and everything, issues surrounding it. All right. So let's go back. We started out with these fibers over here. We talked about different types of fibers and you had a word like oxidative and oxidative like glycolytic, right? And fast glycolytic. So now you can guess that the difference between this slow one and the fast one over here is that there is a lot more aerobic respiration going on here in a muscle that's more heavily uh, filled with these oxidative fibers than there are with muscles filled with these glycolytic fibers. You might also expect that between these two over here, uh, you know, all the things that are associated with getting oxygen, blood vessels, myoglobin, mitochondria, right, are going to be different in these two types of fibers right here because it's going to be, you're going to need a lot of oxygen, which means you need a lot of, uh, you know, blood supply and you need a lot of myoglobin. And then there's this one in the middle that could, these kind of cells are doing both. They can do aerobic and they can do anaerobic. And as we'll see next time, they could switch, you know, based on training, they can kind of switch from one or the other based on whether you're doing heavy lifting a lot or you know, very fast explosive movements versus like slow, like constant things like this. Now you could change, these are the ones that can kind of be modified, but I have to say most people is genetically determined, right? No matter how much I work out, I'm just not gonna get like huge, right? Cause some people just have the genetics, they have a lot you know, more of these uh, like than these, right? That's like the metabolistic part of it. And we'll expand on that a little bit as well as why we call these slow or fast in the next video. All right, see you next time.